So good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to South England Conference to speak at the Bible Study Hour. The last time I did it, I did the Bible Study Hour at South England Conference Camp Meeting was in 2012. So 15 years ago, I'm not even going to ask you if you remember what I talked about. That would not be fair. You know, it's a little bit confusing. They said, you need to come to the South England Conference Camp Meeting. I said, OK, good, glad. I will gladly do it. Where is it? North Wales. OK. But it's not only that, you know. North England Conference has its camp meeting in Southport. And where is Southport? In the north. So. At least the major change since the last time I did it, last time it was early in the morning. You know, we started at 6.30 and some people quoted Psalm 127 that the Lord gives to his beloved one the sleep, so that's why they could not be here. So I am glad to see the crowd this morning. All right, it's nice to have all these people who came to learn something. The tragedy of the contemporary church is that most people study the Bible only to confirm what they always believed, and they never learn anything. So, can I get with the PowerPoint for one screen and then use the camera? Uh, use the camera for one screen and just put the PowerPoint for one screen as well. So, if somebody asks you, what is the Bible all about? What would you say? Salvation, OK. Definitely, salvation is an important topic. But remember, not everybody will be saved. God is going to lose some and still win the war. So it must be about something else than salvation. How God communicates with his people. The important thing is that the Bible did not come to us as a topic or series of topics. Often when we study the Bible, we choose a topic and then we try to find the text here and there. And the problem is that your presuppositions, your prejudices, your prejudice determines what you see and especially what you leave out. So Apostle Paul did not sit down to write how to have or five rules for happy marriage how to find a slim wife or a Christian husband. It came to us as a story. And interestingly enough, when the pioneers had to choose the name for themselves, ultimately they did not choose the two that were at the top favorite, the Church of God and the Disciples of Christ. Ultimately, they chose Seventh-day Adventists, something that points to the beginning and the end of the story. And so the Bible starts with the story of creation. The story starts in the Garden of Eden. The key text there is Genesis 3, 9, which says, Adam, where are you? God did not ask Adam, where are you, because he needs coordinates into his GPS, because he doesn't know. So that when Adam sheepishly says, here, God says, oh, I thought you are behind that bush. You saved me 30 minutes of searching. God asks Adam, where are you, because he wants him to realize, Adam, what has changed in you? Because I am coming today as I did before. Nothing has changed on my part. 
But how come that previously you have been looking forward to our meeting, but now you are hiding? And so the key theological truth from the story of the Garden of Eden is sin does not change God's relationship towards us, but our relationship towards God. And uh, by the way, I talked about this uh, during the 2002 camp meeting. Which relationship got changed? Was it the relationship of God towards us or our relationship toward God? Which one is changed? Our relationship. The only religion in the world that is based on the fact that something has changed in us. All other religions are based on the idea that something has changed in God and somehow you need to change God. Somehow you need to work on him. You need to use some kind of leverage so that you change his relationship toward us. But the Bible clearly says, and the first story of the Bible, the story of creation and the fall, clearly indicates the problem of sin is not what it does to God, that it upsets the big boss. The problem of sin is what it does to you and me. Something breaks in us. And of course, then as the story of creation, Genesis 3 shows, sin not only breaks our relationship with God, the vertical one, but also the horizontal one. Adam, what happened? Adam says, the woman that you gave me. Eve, what happened? The serpent that you created. So the horizontal relationships are broken as well. And so this brings us to the story of Egypt. The story of the Bible starts with the Garden of Eden, but we are not there because of the fall. And then comes the... By the end of the first book of the Bible, Genesis 50 ends with Joseph in a casket. Starts with the, the Garden of Eden, no death, but ends in a... And let's pick up the story from Exodus chapter 1 from verse 5 to 10. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 at all, and Joseph was already in Egypt, so only 69 went down. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful and multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became too numerous so that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, who did not know Joseph, as King James Version says, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. Obviously, they didn't treat them very nicely, so they are afraid that they will join the enemies. And the story continues. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. If I were at Newbold, I would say, underline forced labor. Highlight that. You will hear that in the story again and again. And they built Pitom and Ramses, which are store cities for the Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites, and they worked them ruthlessly. They married their lives bitter and harsh labor, with harsh labor, in brick and mortar, and with all kinds of works in the field. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. So here's the thing. The sin starts in the garden. There is a missing mango. Of course, we know it wasn't mango, but you know, they say an apple. Now, who would take an apple if there was a mango in the garden? You understand? <laughs> in chapter 4, a brother kills another brother. You don't have a white lie, you know, two old ladies gossiping over a cup of coffee. You have a brother killing the brother. It moves from individual to communal, from the garden 
to the whole globe. It moves from interpersonal conflict, from the horizontal breakdown of relationship with God, to a, from a vertical breakdown of relationship with God to horizontal, to create itself a global empire which is in defiance of God. The impulse of sin, its nature and its desire, is to create an empire which is in rebellion against God. And the result is that you have the whole nation oppressed by another nation. And here comes the key text, the second key text of the Bible. The first one was Genesis 3, 9. Adam, where are you? Or humanity, where are you? And here's the second key text of the Bible, of the Exodus story, Exodus 3, 7. The Lord said, and Juan Patrick, Carlos Patrick mentioned this text this morning, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land into the good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. We would say sugar and cholesterol nowadays. And now they cry out the Israelites, now the cry of the Israelites have reached me and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Here is the key phrase, I have heard the cry. God hears the cry. The Hebrew word sabah used there is the same word that is used for the blood of Abel. That's what the blood of Abel is doing. God always hears the cry. As we said, sin never remains only on a personal level. It starts there, but it soon goes from moral, from personal to global, from moral to ethical, from personal to public. When people say, it's my private thing what I do, not exactly, because it's going to have far-reaching consequences for the society. And by the end of the first book of the Bible, sin becomes systemic and structural. A father comes home from his work and his back is bandaged. And the little girl, his daughter, asks him, Dad, what happened to you? And he says, oh, honey, you don't understand. I got beaten today at work. Beaten at work? Why would your boss beat you? Oh, because they increased the quota of bricks and I did not produce my quota. Dad, why didn't you produce your quota of bricks? Oh, because before we had the quota, and now we need to find the straw, and so it's impossible to meet the quota. And that's why I did not meet my quota of bricks. Dad, but why can't your boss be nice to you? Does he have to beat you? Oh, honey, you don't understand, because my boss has a boss about him. And if the quota is not fulfilled, he is in trouble with his boss. And his boss has a boss above him. And so you see, the problem is that the evil is systemic and structural. It's in the whole society. As Adventists, as a movement, awakening movement, revival and reformation movement that started in 19th century uh, America, we have the tendency to fight a pietistic solution to every problem. Are you in a difficult situation? Just open the Bible, find the text, hopefully that's related to your problem, and pray about it. Now, if you visit Auschwitz, if you visit Ravensbrück or other concentration camp, you realize, yeah, if the whole system is oppressing the whole nation, how do you deal with that? A personal piety is not the solution for a structural and systemic problem. 
probably the face that most people have seen on the planet of Earth preaching the gospel is that of Billy Graham. And he managed to preach the gospel to more people than anyone else. And during his campaign, during his crusade, he would point out that you have sinned against the holy God. You are in trouble because of your vertical relationship with God. And so we are going to sing just as I am. And this is your chance to come forward and to repent. And then in 1960s in America, another preacher comes up. His name is Martin Luther King and says, if we have segregated churches, if we have segregated cafeteria, if we have segregated fountains for drinking, we are not followers of Jesus. We have a problem with the systemic and structural evil, which is in, not only in the society, but only in the church of God, the horizontal dimension. And God says, I have heard the cry. I am going to do something about this. And what is it that he does? Because sin always creates this anti-kingdom, which is in rebellion against God. So what is it that God does? He brings the exodus, the salvation act in the Old Testament. Now, here we need to do some translation. And so let's notice that first, Egypt in the Bible, it's a geographical place. It's a real place in history where real Jewish people were once held in literal real slavery. Okay? So please don't put anything contemporary on that metaphor. So Egypt is a real historical place where once in history the real people were in real slavery. However, in the Bible, Egypt becomes a metaphor for any system that holds people down, that keeps people in bondage, that keeps people oppressed and enslaved. There used to be a song that people were singing at the baptism, Good night, Egypt. I bid you good night to Egypt, you know. Besides, on a deeper level, personal, Egypt is a picture of what we are all born into. Every single one of us is born in the same way with a nature that pulls us down, that distorts things, that takes us in the wrong direction and makes us slave to something. You may not be struggling with alcohol or cigarettes, but you might be struggling with something else. Anything that enslaves people is against God's intention, limits your freedom, robs you of your freedom of choice. And so Egypt becomes the picture of the bondage and slavery that every single human being is born into. All of us need our exodus. All of us need to be brought into freedom from our own Egypt. If I ask you, can you tell me your testimony? Can you tell me why you are here? I am pretty sure that most of the stories would have a common denominator saying something like this. I came to the end of my resources, to the end of my rope, and I realized unless God does something, things are not going to work out. I was in this difficult situation, cried out to God, and this is what God did. Your story of deliverance, your story of what God, what God did for you. I have been a pastor since uh, for 34 years, and it only happened once in my old pastoral ministry that a lady came to me. She was an orphan. 
who was adopted into a good family and had a reasonable life. And then she married a nice, very nice gentleman, very gentle guy and reasonably rich. And when she was about 40 years old, she came to me as a pastor and said, there must be somebody up there. I want to thank that God because my life has been so nice, nicer than I ever deserved. That was only once in my pastoral experience that somebody said, you know, life has been so good to me. I need to thank somebody. And by the way, within... We started to, I started to have a Bible studies with her. She was baptized, and within three years, her husband tragically died. Yeah. The story of Job, Act 2, you know. But anyway, here is the first lesson from the story of Exodus. God always hears the cry. There is not a tear you shed that God is not aware of. God always hears the cry. In the Bible, God is portrayed as the one who always hears the cry. Now, you and I live in modern society, which means we are very impatient. Why? Because Hollywood has taught us that you switch on the TV and there is, starts a movie, and within 90 minutes, you see the cast, who played whom, and the problem is resolved. Within 90 minutes, you have the plot, you have the resolution, and the problem resolved. Now tell me, which problem, serious problem in lives, do get resolved within 90 minutes? By the way, how long have Israelites been in Egypt? 430 years. Once again, put it on a shelf. On Friday, we'll pick up that number. Because you know which year did Malachi live in, roughly? 440. And people are going to cry, and God will hear the cry, and a new exodus will start. Not all the problems get resolved from the perspective of 20th of June, 2017. But God hears the cry. God is aware of what's going on in your life. It's the nature of God. God is always on the side of those who cry. And remember, when the new Moses comes, when Jesus comes, and there is a leper, and everybody tries to avoid him, when there is a blind man and everybody says, shut up, shut up, be quiet, hush. Son of David, have mercy on me. Syrophoenician woman, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus hears the cry. Because God always hears the cry. When he finds a tax collector, on a tree, he invites himself for the lunch. When he meets the man who was tormented by evil spirit, the desire of ages says, he heard the unspoken cry of the heart, that the demon did not allow the person to say audibly through his mouth, but there was a cry in the heart to get rid of this slavery. So the first lesson of the story of Egypt is God always hears the cry. The second lesson, the cry inaugurates history. When people cry, something starts happening. I told you the Bible did not come to us in the form of 28 fundamental beliefs. The Bible came to us as a story. Why? Because the story is so powerful. N.T. Wright, Nicholas Thomas Wright, a famous New Testament theologian, says, most people, when they wake up in the morning, they wish for a general at the foot of their bed telling them, do this, don't do that. Instead, the Bible starts, let me tell you a story.
And you read in the Psalms, when we went out of Egypt, it seemed to us like a dream. Waters on the right, waters on the left, and we walked through on a dry land. And then you look at the heading and it says, Psalm of the sons of Korah. Well, wait a minute. Korah is a contemporary of David, and David lived about 1,000 before Christ. You guys did not go out of Egypt. What do you mean, when we went out of Egypt, it seemed to us like a dream? That happened 500 years before your time. Oh, but they knew. When they told the story, when they repeated the story, their lives became part of that story. And that story became part of their lives. If you are married, you know what I'm talking about. The best way to kick start to bring a spark back into your marriage is start remembering how the two of you started. Start remembering the story of your love and you will see the miracle because what is happening now it's part of that previous story and that story is part of what you experience now. Remember the cotton plantation in the United States? And the slaves are singing, I've got shoes, you've got shoes. And the slave owners beat them. You can't sing that song. What do you mean, can't sing that song? The only thing you should care about is the quota of the cotton fulfilled. Who cares what they are singing while they are working? Oh, no, no. The slave owners know very well. The cry inaugurates history. When people cry, something starts happening. The slave owners know very well, if you've got shoes on your mind, it's only a question of time you are going to have shoes on your feet. You can't sing that song, you are barefooted. No. If you've got shoes on your mind, it's only a question of time you are going to have it on your feet. Why? Because that story becomes part of your story, and your life becomes part of that story. When people cry, something starts happening. All right, and here is the last lesson from the story of Exodus. Beloved, I would rather talk about dogmatic topics. Deep down in my heart, I don't like to see the Bible as a story. You know why? It touches me where I don't want to be touched. It's much easier to discuss the last day events, the human nature of Jesus, the Trinity, the millennium, you name it. Because it's clinical, it's out there. You are not part of the picture. But with the story, you are part of this story. As they used to say in homiletics, Patrick, Tua res igitur, in Latin, your matter, your thing is being discussed. You are on the menu. It's about you. So, beloved, do you want to know why Christianity in the West, in the first world, is where it is? You know why? Because you and I don't hear the cry anymore. We are more interested in living an American dream than to hear the story. In 19th century East Coast American village, there were two churches. The one was Presbyterian, which is an American speak for Calvinist. And the other was Episcopalian, which is an American way of saying Anglican. And the question everybody asked is, where is the truth? Do you know what is the question that everybody asks on the cities of London and Birmingham and Prestatin today? What do I get out of this? What is in it for me? Because we want to have a good life. We are more interested in having a good life, living an American dream than anything else. But the Bible says that means you are not the followers of God. Because God 
always hears the cry. God always hears the cry. And if you want to be part of what God is doing, you need to hear the cry. You need to be touched by the suffering of other people. You know the question that is going to be asked at the last judgment? Matthew 25, the parable of the last judgment. You won't believe this, but some people believe that when you come to the heavenly gate, it will be enter your username and your password. And the username is the answer to the question, which day does God expect us to keep? And the password is the answer to the question, in which year did the investigative judgment start? Oh, I know that. No. The question to be asked, according to Matthew 25, is what have you done for the little ones? In other words, in the words of the Exodus story, did you hear the cry? And they say, when did we see you? Oh, for you, Jesus, we would do anything. We would carry your suitcase, we would do anything for you. But who cares about the marginalized, about the little ones? And Jesus says, your nature is not my nature. You are not the followers of me. When we hear the cry, we are on God's side. Do you know that more than two billion of people live on less than two dollars per day? And I mean today and tomorrow. If you got three pounds in your pocket or in your wallet, in your purse, you are a rich person. You are better off than half of the population of this world. Do you know why you buy your shirt for 10 pounds? And you say, oh, thank you, Jesus, such a nice bargain. Because some children on the other part of the world produce it for one dollar per day. But they don't care. As long as I get my shirt and cheaply, who cares? When you think about the events taking place in our country in the last few weeks and months, do we hear the cry? God says, I brought you out of Egypt because I heard your cry. I was not indifferent through what you are going through. I want a new type of community, of community that hear the cry. The only way to redeem a broken story is to embed it in a bigger story. The longer you have lived on this planet, the more you will accumulate bad experiences. Ernst Hemingway said, a life has a way of breaking down everybody. All of us have problems. But the only way to redeem a broken story is to see it as a part of the bigger story. And why they are crying, and why they are crying for 400 years, and it seems nobody listens, nobody cares. God comes and says, I have heard the cry, I have seen the oppression, I know the misery, and I am going to do something about it. And so, here is the summary. The story continues with Egypt. Location is Egypt. 
The key text is Exodus 3, 7. The key phrase is, I have heard the cry. God always hears the cry. And the key theological truth for us to learn is that when God hears the cry, he brings rescue and redemption from sin and oppression. God brings rescue and redemption from any sin and any oppression. If you understand the Bible story, you will not end up only with the vertical dimension of your gospel, me and my sweet Jesus. You will realize also the communal responsibility we have to hear the cry and to bring freedom from any kind of oppression. We are not going to tolerate racism, sexism, whatever, you name it, any ism that brings oppression. Because God brings freedom from any sin and any oppression. I don't know what's heavy on your heart this morning. I don't know where you are in your spiritual journey. But here is the good news of the Exodus story. God knows what's going on in your heart. God has heard your cry, has seen your tears knows your dissatisfaction and he's willing to help you. He's willing to help you through brothers and sisters, through local community of believers, through his community, through his church. And that's why he brought freedom to the children of Israel 3,500 years ago and he brings freedom to each one of us today because he wants us to be a different type of community. That's why I brought you out of Egypt, so that you are a different type of community. What is God's answer to the systemic and structural evil? A new type of community where there is no oppression where we live in love, enabling, empowering one another. Did the story end there? No. It continues on. And from Egypt, we'll go to Sinai. And we learn how the story continued with the children of Israel tomorrow. So remember, the same place, same time, we'll continue with the story.